The United Kingdom, comprising England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, was one of 28 members of the European Union. As part of the European Union, the UK enjoyed a common economic market with common customs for goods and services. That meant that trade flowed freely from the UK to the EU and the EU to the UK. Here's an important detail for us that also meant that trade flowed freely between this part of the UK, Northern Ireland, and the Republic of Ireland, another EU country. Goods also went freely across the Irish Sea between the UK and Northern Ireland in both directions. Everyone was on the same team and stuff just moved around. But as of the 31st of January 2020, the United Kingdom is no longer part of the European Union. How would all these goods travel and be checked without membership in the common market and customs union? Well, for three of the four parts of the United Kingdom, England, Scotland, and Wales, the issue is limited. There is a body of water between them and the European Union, but not Northern Ireland, which shares a land border with an EU country, the Republic of Ireland. By the way, a super sensitive land border, a land border with no border checks or formal crossings for very good reasons. So for the island of Ireland as a whole, there is a clear problem. If EU and UK regulations change, if goods have different standards or are subject to different taxes, how can these standards be managed across this border? This is a free flowing border. In practice, differing standards can't be easily held. And this is an issue that goes way beyond whether the widget that crosses from the Republic of Ireland into Northern Ireland has met regulation or had tariffs applied. This is an issue with historical weight because this border has historical weight. The existence of a divided Ireland and the constitutional structure of the United Kingdom hang in the balance. Oh, and a uh, human life too. The original plan was for all of Ireland to continue to swear oath and allegiance to the British crown. After the War of Irish Independence, 1919 to 1921, the Free Irish State was created. In practice, the Free State comprised 26 southern and western counties of the island of Ireland. The remaining six counties opted out and remained part of the United Kingdom as Northern Ireland. As per the Anglo-Irish Treaty, the 26 counties of the Free Irish State would be a dominion of the crown. Its politicians would swear an oath to the king. The oath went, in part, I do solemnly swear I will be faithful to his majesty King George V, his heirs and successors. Now imagine you've just fought a war against his majesty's government for an independent Irish Republic. And now, having fought that war and pushed the United Kingdom to a treaty which offers Irish self-government, now you still have to pledge allegiance to the crown of the colonizer. To many Irish Republicans, this was unacceptable. Though advocates of the treaty emphasized the first part of the oath was to swear, quote, true faith and allegiance to the constitution of the Irish free state, this was not enough to placate critics. The partition of the island of Ireland with Northern Ireland still in the UK was presented as a fait accompli and thus was considered by Irish Republicans as another difficult reality to accept. Differences over the treaty and the continued influence of British monarchs and armed forces led to the Irish Civil War between 1922 and 23. Forces of the pro-treaty provisional Irish government and anti-treaty Irish Republican army IRA clashed until pro-treaty forces prevailed. While still a dominion of the crown, the Free State of Ireland would drift further from the United Kingdom within a decade. A leader of the anti-treaty side of the Civil War, Eamon de Valera, founded a new political party. This new Republican party would pursue distancing from its dominion status through politics rather than warfare. De Valera was selected by the Dale as the president of Ireland's Republican Council, effectively prime minister of the Free State. Through his first term and reselection in 1937, he would dismantle the Anglo-Irish Treaty, removing the oath of allegiance to the British monarch, weakening the crown's power to deny Irish Free State legislation, and setting about an independent trading policy. After the sudden abdication of King Edward VIII, the United Kingdom recoiled inward. A new Irish constitution was opportunistically adopted. The sovereign state would now simply be known as Ireland, and it would replace the British monarch with a new head of state, the President of Ireland. That constitution has remained as the framework of government for the Republic of Ireland today.
So what was going on in Northern Ireland during the Irish Civil War? Well, the fighting in the Free State allowed pro-Unionists to consolidate. The six counties and their allegiance to the United Kingdom were solidified. A border was defined. But south of this border were not exclusively pro-Irish nationalists, just as north of the border were not exclusively pro-United Kingdom Unionists. The partition of the island of Ireland repeated an oft ill-advised practice in history. Draw a border as it suits you and and hope for the best. The best did not come. The creation of Northern Ireland condemned a minority of its population to second-class status. While about two-thirds of Northern Ireland's population were Protestant, largely favoring union with the UK, a significant minority were Catholic. This group largely favored a united Ireland. The Catholic, mostly nationalist minority faced political disadvantages, which manifested in economic difficulty. The Protestant, mostly unionist majority, held tight control over governing in Northern Ireland and drew election boundaries that strengthened their one-party control. With this political power, unionists gave themselves advantages in getting a job and when building and allocating housing. Unsurprisingly, the opposite came to be true for Catholics, who saw an unemployment rate double that of Protestants and struggled to find suitable housing for their families. Within this unhappy structure, Catholics claim they are the principal victims, accusing the Protestant government of depriving them of work votes and municipal housing by political and religious discrimination. In the 1960s, Catholics in the North organized to resist this structural discrimination. 1967 marks the birth of the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Movement, which demanded a fair system for voting, housing, and work. The movement attracted a broad political spectrum of Northern Catholics, partly inspired by the protests of Dr. Martin Luther King in the US. In one march against housing discrimination, marchers sang, we shall overcome. Soon the civil rights movement would meet violence, marking a period known as the Troubles. An October 68 march in Londonderry was met with unionist bully clubs and water cannons. Unionists met Republican demonstrators in this way repeatedly. By 1969, things were spiraling. In August, Protestant and Catholic street clashes spread from Londonderry to Belfast. By 1971, the Provisional Irish Republican Army was militarizing and meeting violence with violence, targeting soldiers and setting bombs. Civilians on both sides were supporting and joining paramilitary groups. There was a crescendo on Bloody Sunday, the 30th of January, 1972. British soldiers in Derry, theoretically a neutral peacekeeping force, shot 26 civilians civil rights protesters. They did so in full view of the media. Young Republican Catholics were further militarized in the aftermath, bolstering the ranks of the IRA. There was no going back. 72 was the most violent year of the Troubles. From its start in the late 60s until the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, the Troubles would see violence between unionist and nationalist paramilitary groups, attacks on infrastructure, civilians, and the British Army. Over 16,000 bombings were carried out and nearly 37,000 shootings, resulting in around 3,500 deaths mostly civilians. Broadly speaking, the aims of the Unionist groups were the continued existence of a Protestant-dominated Northern Ireland within the United Kingdom. The Republicans, or Nationalists, came to expect a united Ireland and the expulsion of the British from the island of Ireland and justice for the disadvantaged Catholics of Northern Ireland. After decades of conflict, these seemingly unbridgeable differences were brokered through the 1998 Good Friday Agreement. Representatives of the parties of Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, and the British negotiated a ceasefire, established a devolved parliament and executive for Northern Ireland, in which power would be shared by Republicans and Unionists, agreed to decommissioning of weapons, and then an all-Irish referendum to confirm it all. When the referendums won majorities, the troubles were effectively over. One of the most visible aspects of this Good Friday Agreement was the dismantling of border infrastructure. Today, the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland is nearly invisible. Not only is the lack of border checks a sign of progress and a climb down from the violence of the Troubles, but it's critical to the prosperity of the island. To this day, Northern Ireland lags behind economically. Free movement of goods and people is a long
long-term means to ending this disparity. Now that you understand the difficult history of the border, you can see why leaving the European Union was such a sensitive issue. Sadly, as my last video on the subject showed, it was an issue largely ignored during the 2016 Brexit referendum. The troubles lasted from, let's say, roughly late 60s to 1998. So more or less 30 years. Here we are, less than 30 years on from the Good Friday Agreement, and the Irish border is, by choice of UK leadership and voters, a problem. The United Kingdom voted to leave the European Union in June of 2016, after an arduous process of getting a new Prime Minister to declare the intention to leave, ditching that Prime Minister for not negotiating the way Brexit supporters wanted, bringing in a new Prime Minister that vaguely said he would negotiate a harder line with Europe, getting a Brexit agreement, ratifying it, and ringing the bells in Big Ben, the United Kingdom finally left the European Union on the 31st of January 2020. Story concluded, nothing more to discuss. Except for all of the ongoing issues Brexit left in its wake, either non-conclusively dealt with in the Brexit agreement or one simply punted into procedural affairs, committees, and subgroups to determine immigration agreements, fishing rights, financial services, and regulations. And of course, there is the issue of the Irish border, as we've learned the issue with the most historical weight. As part of the EU Single Market and Customs Union, any Republic of Ireland national could go to Northern Ireland, and any teddy bear assembled in Northern Ireland could be imported and sold in the Republic of Ireland or another part of the European Union. But the UK leaving the Single Market and Customs Union introduced substantial risk. Products could be subject to customs duties or tariffs, meaning a need for border checks. The freedom of movement of people might have ended, meaning a need for immigration border checks. The Irish border seemed to take a backseat to other issues during the 2016 referendum campaign, but it's not as though politicians didn't realize this might be a problem. In a 2018 speech, Prime Minister Theresa May laid out foundational aspects of a future relationship between the UK and EU, including this quote. I am not going to let our departure from the European Union do anything to set back the historic progress that we have made in Northern Ireland, nor will I allow anything that would damage the integrity of our precious union. It begged the question, how? How could borders be enforced, tariffs applied, immigration papers checked, all without a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic? It was to be a question for the next prime minister to answer. It is not at all controversial to say that Boris Johnson didn't have a concrete plan for the island of Ireland either. Campaigning to be prime minister, Johnson promised his version of Brexit would, as he tweeted, under no circumstances will there be a hard border on the island of Ireland, nor will I accept a deal that sees Northern Ireland taken out of the UK's customs territory. Johnson insisted a deal with the EU would fulfill the same two seemingly contradictory promises. All of the UK would leave the customs union and single market, and there would be no hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic. But to Johnson's credit, a new Brexit deal with the EU did arrive. The specific impact of the deal for the island of Ireland was at first unclear. Labour Party opposition released internal government documents in December of 2019, which set out the need for potential customs checks on the island of Ireland under the deal. Prime Minister Johnson denied the report, saying, the deal we've done with the EU is a brilliant deal. Unlike the previous arrangements, it allows the whole of the UK to come out of the EU, including Northern Ireland. He went on, there's no question of there being checks on goods. It's very clear that there should be unfettered access between Northern Ireland and the rest of Great Britain. Today, we know that simply wasn't true. The deal did come up with a creative solution for the island of Ireland. Rather than introduce a customs border between Northern Ireland and the Republic, the deal introduced a customs border in the Irish Sea. Goods coming into Northern Ireland from the United Kingdom would be subject to checks upon arrival. That is known as the Northern Ireland Protocol. Boris Johnson's claimed unfettered access between Northern Ireland and the rest of Great Britain was not achieved. But putting a customs border in the sea rather than on land was the preferable solution, right? Well, in the short term, yes. In the long term, it's wobbly. Unionists in Northern Ireland are angry. They have, as of the writing of this video, refused to participate in power sharing in Northern Ireland until their concern over the Northern Ireland Protocol is resolved, leaving Northern Ireland without a governing executive. So what is their concern? Well, there's really only one big problem. If there is a customs border between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK, 
is Northern Ireland really still in the United Kingdom? If people and goods can move freely between the Republic of Ireland, a European Union member, and Northern Ireland, but people and goods can't move freely from the UK into Northern Ireland, with which union is Northern Ireland closer, the UK or EU? At a minimum, the Northern Ireland Protocol weakens the economic bonds of the United Kingdom. A deal brokered by Boris Johnson's conservative and unionist party makes the union less firm. If you're a unionist, you want Northern Ireland to have the closest relationship possible to the rest of the UK, so an arrangement like this is bad news. Thus, Northern Irish unionists agitate for change to the protocol. In response to that agitation, the UK government has tried to correct course. And let's be real, they've gone at it clumsily. A Northern Ireland Protocol Bill was passed through the House of Commons. If it became law, the bill would give the UK government the power to modify the terms of the Brexit deal by themselves. It would alter the exit deal they agreed with the European Union without the approval of the other side of the deal, the European Union. If that sounds problematic to you, maybe even illegal, you're on the right track. In the UK government's New Deal, with themselves, goods on track to Northern Ireland, which would stay in Northern Ireland, would not be subject to checks, while goods on track to Northern Ireland, which would go on to the Republic and EU, would be subject to checks. It's a green lane, red lane gobbledygook. This plan raised alarm bells with the European Union, who naturally saw a unilateral altering of the Northern Ireland Protocol worth objection. Whether a negotiated settlement is possible without the bill taking effect, is yet to be seen. In October 2022, newly installed Conservative Prime Minister Rishi Sunak spoke with the Irish Prime Minister, as in the Republic of Ireland. The statement from the Prime Minister's office after revealed the current UK government's tactic on this. Keep the bill moving as a pressure tactic, but offer the EU a chance at negotiation of the protocol with the call readout saying Sunak, quote, set out that his preference remained for a negotiated outcome. I discussed this with the Taoiseach, we had a very positive meeting, and what I want to do is find a negotiated solution, preferably. But here's the danger in this game. The Democratic Unionist Party has stated they will not accept a new power-sharing arrangement for Northern Ireland until the protocol bill advances. If Northern Ireland goes without a power-sharing arrangement for too long, the Northern Irish Parliament at Stormont is suspended and governing power goes back to London. Hmm. Northern Ireland governed by the UK. That's something that Northern Irish Republicans object strongly to. Indeed, the leader of Sinn Féin recently said that there can be, quote, no return to direct rule from London. And what happens if it does? Well, we really don't know. It's happened before since the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, sometimes for long stretches, but the stakes are bigger this time because the border and the fundamental relationship between the UK and Northern Ireland are involved in the disagreement. This is a game the conservative and unionist party started playing, but whose consequences will play out across the Irish Sea. In my first video on this subject, I suggested the UK had two options, stay aligned with the EU on trade to preserve the Irish border, or basically saw off Northern Ireland from the UK. The UK is kind of stuck. On the one hand, they could stay aligned with Europe, keep the open border, but then lose the exit part of Brexit. On the other hand, they could realign away from Europe, but potentially cut off Northern Ireland in the process. Well, here we are, years later, and we have an answer. The UK has chosen to weaken its bond to Northern Ireland in order to carry out Brexit. And this bears emphasizing, no intellectually honest member of the UK government can feign surprise. A leaked government document reported to the government that the original Brexit deal, quote, will be highly disruptive to the Northern Ireland economy. It goes on, the withdrawal agreement has the potential to separate Northern Ireland in practice from whole swaths of the UK's internal market, with a constitutional effect that, quote, Northern Ireland is symbolically separated from the union and the economic union is undermined. Highly disruptive, symbolically separated, separated in practice. Who knew that a few years of Brexit would do more for a united Ireland than the Irish Civil War and decades of the Troubles? Later, y'all.